So I promised I would tell some national youth gathering stories. And you might be thinking, oh, he's going to hit us with some of these great mountaintop experiences. And that will come next Sunday. Today, I want to talk about we experienced a little bit of the pit. So um, on the last day of the gathering, Mariah comes to me and she says, now I owe her $5, but she comes to me and she says, she says, you just need to listen and not talk. Now when, when your young daughter says this to you, that, I was just like, okay, yes ma'am. And she says, I think I lost my wallet. I'm like, oh no. Was there a lot of money in there? Yep. A couple hundred bucks, something like that. When did it happen? I think it happened when we were at the gathering last night. Okay. She says, my backpack, it might have unzipped. I don't understand. I don't know what happened. So we said, well, okay. Well, when we get there, because they had this really awesome lost and found um, that was manned by the YAVs, right? Some of you guys know what the YAVs are. These, are. these are young adult volunteers. And then they also had community CLBs, community community life builders. They were all working there. There's so many, Lutherans have so many acronyms. I'm sorry. But anyway, so... So we, were, we, were, we went there, and we got there, and we went to the lost and found, and you know, they do the whole thing, describe your wallet to us so that you know, it's actually her wallet. And she does, and they're like, okay, here it is. And she gets it, and she opens it up, and it's got all the stuff, like the, the, the ID and all the stuff she's worried about having to replace, and then it opens up, and the money's gone. And you might be going, if it was found on the floor of the National Youth Gathering, where we're all there praising Jesus and we're celebrating what he has done, that means someone who was actually participating in the event must have stolen her money. And then you might be thinking, oh, maybe it was just one of those workers there. Maybe it was one of the staff people who don't even know Jesus. They don't know anything about this. And they're up sweeping the floor that night, and they're like, oh, there's a wallet. Let's take some cash. But then on our way home, we're getting words on because there's this Facebook group where all the people are sharing stories and telling things, and the word starts to come up that people in our section, multiple backpacks had been opened and wallets removed. And so maybe, we don't know if that's exactly what happened with Mariah, but we were in the same time at the same place, pretty good chance. So now your heart goes to this place where you're like, you mean to tell me some young kids, or maybe, who knows, maybe it was adults who were there, were crawling under seats and opening backpacks and taking wallets out? Sure looks that way. And you're like, how could this happen? And the answer is people are broken, right? And so then we've, we, 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 a variety of emotions come in, right? And so part of it is, well, we, we pray that they needed the money because, well, you know, they got it now. Or maybe somehow that through this, God will work to restore their hearts. Certainly that's our prayer. But however it happened, somebody stole some money and from not just Mariah, but lots of kids. And so... It's kind of relevant to our discussion today of forgive us as we forgive others. Part of prayer, when we ask the question how to pray, is it's very interesting that Jesus himself brings this up right in the middle of the prayer. Like, give us today our daily bread, like you guys studied last week, and forgive us as we forgive others. I was probably about... Um, not even, I don't know if I'm maybe preteen, maybe 12, 13 years old, somewhere, and when someone first, I mean, I was going through confirmation, and we learned the Lord's Prayer, we memorized it, but I never thought about what it said. And then somebody said, you know, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're actually praying for your forgiveness as you are forgiving others. I was like, no, it doesn't say that. And then, you know, even though I had to memorize, I was like, wait, forgiveness? Ooh, that is in there. And, and so then your, your question is, is like, we're sitting there praising God and at the mountaintop and jumping up and down and, and doing the happy dance. And literally while we're doing that, someone's like, see what's happening. And, and so what, what does that do to your heart? Well, we've got to take a look at some passages because we need God's Word to help us navigate this. Matthew chapter 18, verse 24. And we're also going to put verse 28 up there because I want you to see how they work together. Um, There was a man who owed the king, and then we put on there more than 164,000 years of wages. Which what I did, how I got my seven billion, is I went up and I looked at like, what is the average income in Missouri? It turns out it's about 45,000. So if you take that and multiply that by 164,000 years, that's how much he owed to the master. And now he was a slave. He wasn't a business owner. He wasn't, you know, an an up-and-coming entrepreneur. He had a maximum wage that would probably be much lower than the one I'm giving us for the average in Missouri. He would probably be like, well, how long would it take 
somebody who works at McDonald's to pay off this debt. Well, now you're talking about much, much more money. And so the idea there is that it was an unpayable debt. Unpayable. He could never pay it in his lifetime a thousand times over, a hundred thousand times over. But one of his fellow servants owed him about four months' worth of wages. About four months' worth of wages. Now, again, not a, not a small amount. A little more than Mariah had in her wallet. But not, not billions. And he goes over and he chokes him. Give it to me. Pay me back. Right? Yikes. Take a look at verses 27 and 30. Now, you guys always watch these. These say MLV because that's what we're doing. We're going literal translation. Mark's literal version. And so, and so this is very important because the NIV says that he took pity. And in 1984, when that was translated, that would maybe be appropriate. But nowadays, pity is kind of has a negative connotation. We're like, oh, I'm really sorry that happened to you. That's more, we have a more sarcastic pity nowadays. No, this was compassion. He actually took pity, like real pity, like compassion on this person. He cared for them. He looked at that slave, at that servant, and he said, I'm so sorry this is the case. I don't want it to be the case. And so he forgave him the debt. He released him and forgave him the debt. But the slave, now this is the other part of it, is that the, the word there, of course, we all... You know, if, if you were with me in my Greek class at seminary, anytime you have a participle, it has potentially continuing action when it's in predicate position, which is the case here. And so everybody's like, oh my goodness. And so, but that's so important because it means he kept on. He, he was kept on refusing. He kept on, as my professor Dr. Gibbs would say, he kept on not being willing. He kept on not being willing. He was refusing. It was this act of like, no, 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 no. I will not forgive. And so he had him thrown into prison. Now, you know, we've all, I think, felt some of these emotions on both sides. I think sometimes, I mean, I want you to sit there and think about it. Because if you're like me, when you start reading this story and you start getting into the story, you start thinking, well, I think I forgave that person. I tried. And then there's another person maybe I tried to forgive. But then there's that one person. I don't know if I can forgive that person. How do you forgive someone? You might be sitting there very openly and honestly saying, I don't know how to forgive somebody. Well, God, it's a great place to be. We're going to study this question. And so Matthew chapter 18, verse 33, he says, the king said, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And I mean, guys, that question is for you and for me. He's asking the servant, but he's asking Mark. Right? That's who he's asking. He's asking you and me. And he's saying, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And once again, that that feeling of yikes swells up. But we've got to define mercy because mercy is a word that's very interesting. It's somewhat of a church word, um, but it does appear elsewhere. But it, it literally means not receiving what you deserve. Mercy means not receiving what you deserve or what I deserve. And I deserve a whole lot. And praise God for his mercy. In the, in the old style of worship, sometimes you'll do what's called um, the Kyrie, which is a Greek word for Lord. And so the Kyrie goes like this, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. That's kind of, and you sing that kind of over and over again. Although I always struggle with the logical part of that because it comes right after the forgiveness of sins. So I've always been like, yeah. Anyway, so that's why we don't do it in the way that they do it in the old system because it's very confusing in the practice. Well, I thought he just did have mercy. In the, anyway, so Lutherans are weird like me. And so the idea is, is that how do, we, how do we grasp mercy? The height and width and depth and breadth of the love of God. And this is this idea that he says mercy is is, is not receiving what you deserve. He let him go. He released his debt. Take a look at Colossians 3, verses 2 to 3. This is our companion text, and it's so important because a lot of times when we go to set our minds on things above, we start thinking in terms of be a good person, try harder, do more, get better. That's the things above. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's certainly that in there. There's, we'll talk about that, but there's something first before all of that. It's mercy. It's grace. Now, we said mercy is this idea of not receiving what we do deserve. Grace 
contrary or inverted of that, is receiving what we don't deserve. Mercy is not receiving what we do, and grace is receiving what we do not deserve. And so, so when we put our minds, when we set our minds, our hearts, our whole beings on the things that are above, where do we set it? Because you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I want you to consider this for a minute. This is the good news, by the way. This is the gospel. It means that no matter what happens, the law does not have a claim against you. The law does not have a claim against you. Here's what we mean by that. So, so if I'm out driving home this afternoon and I decide to put her up at about 75 on Highway 160 where the speed limit is 60, then the Christian County, Stone County Sheriff, whichever one I'm in at the moment, might not appreciate that. And he might want to reward me for my achievement in writing. Right? This is how that would work. And so, so that, law, that law applies to me. Okay? But now if I was an ambassador and I had one of those big black, you know, ambassador cars that have the flags on them, and I'm driving down the highway. They could pull me over and they could say, look, you need to slow down. But the law does not apply to me because I have diplomatic immunity. You and I are hidden with Christ in God. And when we hear the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, sometimes those hit us and they, they ugh, but they do, not, they do not have a claim on you and me. We have diplomatic immunity. We are co-heirs with Christ, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 6, we are no longer under the law. I'm sorry, I'm doing Romans again. I apologize for that. But anyway, the idea here is that you died. You died. That's the whole position of the Scriptures. When you were baptized, you were buried with Christ in His death, and you were united with Him in His resurrection. You were. And you're like, but, but I don't even know when that happened. It doesn't matter. Trust His words. Let His words hit your eardrums. Let them vibrate and go into your heart because that is what it means when He has mercy on you. He has seen fit. We don't understand how or why. He has seen fit to bring you out of the darkness and into His glorious light. This is the truth. And how do we respond? By setting our things, our mind, on things above. So let's go back to real life. So Mariah is telling me the story, and of course, she's trying to say, Dad, don't freak out. And of course, Dad freaks out. And so then, and, and, and I'm very sorry for that, but it, I did. And I, you know, I was like, okay, but I got to try to bottle up my emotions. But I was like, oh, that's just such a, oh. And then as more information became known, then my frustration with, I'm like, oh, I didn't teach enough on how to secure the wallet. Actually, the wallet was perfectly secure. And so she, she's great. But what we found out was that there were people doing bad things. So then look at what happened to the heart. It shifted, and it became, it, you know, the eyes turned red. And then I'm like, well, where are they? Let's go get them, you know. Let's get three or four guys, and let's beat them up, you know. Let's find them. And then you realize there's like 30,000 people there, and you're not going to find anybody. So, um, every, in fact, I, countless people online said, hey, I was at the National Youth Gathering. I didn't see you. And I'm like, yeah, I wonder why. So the idea here is how do, what happens when it shifts, right, when our heart shifts, and how do we deal with this, and how do we go forward? Take a look at verses 3 chapter 3, verse 12. He says, therefore, based on who you are, based on who you are, you are God's chosen people. Can, 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 I, I, I know this is going to be weird for those of you who grew up in, a, in a, you know, like a real reverent faith tradition, but can you just say out loud, I am chosen? You did that so well. You are chosen by God, by the Most High God who moved heaven and earth for you, who brought heaven to earth for you. He was born in a manger. And he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross for you. And you are now his people, right? So what do we do? It's kind of like what, what Barry's writing this new book. It's called, you know, I, I, I am a child of God. Now what? Right? And this, it, here's the answer, right? And of course, his book does it much more eloquently. But the idea here is that it's, you're, how do we do it? Well, we got to put on the right clothes. Every one of us do this every day. You dress appropriately. And I'm one of those guys who will always call people. In fact, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but we had our groundbreaking service about a month ago. And, and um, I was like, what is the right thing to wear to a groundbreaking service? Part of me was like, you know, three-piece suit. Or maybe, you know, you get one of those old pastoral albs, the robes that pastors wear. Or then, you know, maybe I just wear what I normally wear on Sunday. And then, but I was like, but it's going to be like 95 degrees. And so, so Pastor Dar and I were, were going to be the speakers there that day. And so... I was literally typing a text to him when he, I got a text from him and said, what are you wearing? 
And I was like, yeah, yeah. We didn't know what to wear. We didn't know how to dress appropriately. So we both decided shorts. That's what we were going to wear because it was so hot. But the idea here is you have to make a question. How, what do I put on today? What do I wear today? This place where I'm going, how do I dress for that? Oh, I don't know. How about compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now it turns out those are the fruit of the Spirit. Those are just selections from the fruit of the Spirit. And those are the things that the Spirit will rise up from within you. It will come out of you. So when it's coming out, put it on. Right? This is what we do. And so it's because of who you are. It doesn't, doing these things doesn't make you God's people. You already are. Now, let's go with them. Take a look at verse 13. So every once in a while, people will email me, text me, or call me and say, Pastor, this person in the church hurt my feelings. And I'm like, I'm really sorry to hear that. And then this is what we should do. Yeah, and it's hard. I'm not, I'm not, you know, it's so easy for me to say. Much harder for me to do or for anyone else to do. But this is the key, guys. And this is why Jesus taught, teaches us in the Lord's Prayer to forgive, to Forgive us as we forgive one another. Because here's the thing. This whole idea of the vertical relationship with God, which I grew up in, I grew up hearing so powerfully and so purely saying, Jesus loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. He saved you. But what did Jesus say the whole time He was here? He said, love your neighbor. He goes, I tell you, love your enemy. Right? You cannot have this Without this, you cannot have the vertical without the horizontal. It does not work. It's two sides of one coin. If you'll allow that analogy. He says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, you might be sitting there saying, if you're like me, and you might be sitting there saying, yeah, but you don't know what that person did. They didn't steal 100 or 200 bucks out of somebody's wallet. This person committed a murder. This person committed adultery. This person destroyed my life. This person destroyed my children's lives. Was it a couple summers ago in Sutherland Spring, Texas? A man walked into the church service and opened fire, killing multiple people. And it's, we, you know, even as we're talking about building a church building, the conversation of security comes in. You know, we need to have like stormtroopers at the, at the door to prevent people from coming in or whatever. I don't know. Stormtroopers wouldn't be good because they can't hit anything. But um, <laughs> that's from Star Wars. That's a joke. But anyway, so, so the idea is, is, that, is that, you know, how do you react to that? But, but before we even talk about that, it's interesting to know what the people of Sutherland Springs did. They did this. They had to do it. They understood. It took time. You had grief and you had anger and you had outrage and you had all those feelings. But eventually, and you could, go, you could go to the folks in South Carolina, the same thing happened in their church. And the guy didn't die. That guy didn't die. So they had to go to him and forgive him. And, and the people in the courtroom were like, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And we're like, yeah, that's because it's Jesus. It doesn't make sense that a man rose from the grave, which we proclaim and, re- and hold on to and survive because of. And it also doesn't make sense that that living Jesus will live in our bodies and give us the power to do this. So if you're sitting there and you're like, Mark, I can't forgive that person. You don't know what he did. I I would sit there and say, I agree with you. You can't. Not on your own. And so it's very important to understand that forgiveness is both a choice and there is an emotional difficulty that goes along with it. The choice is saying, Lord Jesus, help me forgive. I can't do it on my own. And you know what he'll say to you? Copy that. I'm with you until the very end of the age. I will hold you in my arms and I will give you my spirit and I will show you how to forgive those who have sinned against you because he knows a little something about that, of the man who was nailed to two beams of wood, who while he was being nailed said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. This is the power of the gospel. It is the power of Jesus by his spirit through his word for you and for me. So understand the choice of forgiving can be a choice to say, I want to forgive, I need to forgive, but I really don't know how and I don't even know where to begin. And then you remember, when did Jesus teach us to do this? In prayer. In prayer. How to pray? Father, help me forgive because I ain't getting it done. Not on my own. Give me the power and He will say yes. He promises to do this. He will help you share what you have. 
take a look at verses 14, and then we have a special guest appearance from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this idea is this over all these virtues, put on love, see, which binds them all together in perfect unity. If you have, if you have a church community where you have great doctrine, but you don't have love, I mean, it's just the truth. If you, you can't have great doctrine if you don't have love. If you have a church community where you're feeding the poor, but you don't have love, right? It has to have love. Love is the power, the actual physical, concrete reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit through Christ. And, and you know, I love what, Barbara, you've often said to me, and I love how you said it, without Jesus, I don't know that anyone can truly love. And I think that that's exactly right. Without Jesus, love isn't really even a thing. Love becomes kind of an emotion or maybe it's something you try to do. You have a warm fuzzy. I don't know what it is. But love is when you lay your life down for someone. You submit to someone. You put yourself below them in order to help them. You go down so that they would go up. And of course, we all know the default position of the human race. We push others down so that we would be lifted up. That's our default position. So what Jesus is saying is upside down kingdom, right? What did he do with all authority on heaven and earth? He laid it down and he died on the cross for you and for me. And so when we put on love, when that's the ultimate final garment we put around our shoulders, it's his love made perfect in in unity in our lives. And of course, this reminds us that if we have all the things in the world, all the spiritual gifts, all the gifts to the poor, whatever, but we don't have love, nothing. So how do we do it? You guys already know. I've been hinting. I've been doing spoilers the whole time. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Somebody said, how do you, I was actually talking to a seminary student while I was at the National Youth Gathering. He goes, he goes, so he was wanting to learn about different worship formats in different church bodies and different situations. And and we were doing a discussion about this because we were in a session about how to do worship with youth. And I, my response was, well, I think as long as the Word of God there is there, I don't care what the rest of it is. You know, whatever it is, it's got to have the Word of God. And he's like, he's like, speak to that. Talk about that. And we said, you've got to drench people in the Word of God. Absolute drench, marinate, however, whatever, whatever word picture you want to see. It's like you're just swimming in it. And everybody's like, okay, yeah, but don't go too much, Mark. You're going to kill us. No, no, no. God will take care of it. But look at what it, how it works. The Word of Cross... Word of Christ dwells in you richly as you teach and admonish. Now that word admonish, again, going back to 1984 when this translation was made, it's, it's more like guidance. Admonish now sounds more like when you're slapping somebody. Eh, that's not what it means. It's this guidance. It's, it's, it's course correction. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, it's like if you're teaching a, a, a kid to ride a bike, right? And you're like, you're trying to hold them up and, until they can get the balance. That's, that's what admonish truly means in this word. And so you're teaching and you're guiding. You're actually demonstrating to one another with all wisdom, and there it is, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. A song is, the, or a psalm, I should say, is Scripture. It's God's prayer book right in the middle of the Bible. It's one thing we talk so much about at the National Youth Gathering. It's there for you and for me so we can learn how to pray. Everyone always says to me, I don't know how to pray. And I'm like, let's start with just the one word prayer, Jesus. Just cry it out. I'm serious. And then grow and, and read Matthew 6 like we've been doing. It's okay. Our Father. Wait, wait, God's my Father? Mm-hmm. He's in heaven. What does that mean? Keep going. Hallowed be your name. Let your name be holy here. Let your kingdom, let your kingdom come here. Right? And then, give us. Give us what we need when we need it. Right? And, and forgive us. And help us to forgive one another. This is what we need. We we, we have psalms, we have hymns, and we have spiritual songs, and we do it with gratitude to God in our hearts. So this is what we're going to do. We've got to pray. That's what we do. If we're learning to pray, we've got to actually pray. And my invitation to you is that you would take these thoughts and these, these ideas and take your little half sheets, which have study notes that you can continue studying in. There's a shameless plug there. Please do it. And you take that with you, and, and then as you're, as you're growing in, in Christ in your particular walk, you can say, how do I do this? Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Please pray with me. Father, we ask you boldly to do this, just exactly this, that you would put the words of Jesus, your word, the word of God, who came and made his dwelling among us. Let his dwelling be in us, richly. We don't understand that 
in a concrete way, but we understand the promise that it brings. And that we would carry that forth by responding, by participating in your word, by singing. It doesn't make any sense. Where in the world do people get together and sing? Well, right here. And so we pray that you would help us continue to sing because you have commanded us to do this by your power so that we would grow in prayer and in the knowledge and in the wisdom of your word power of the gospel which gives faith and i pray boldly that you would help each one of us have that happen in our daily lives not just here and when we go out of here and we just get back into the world and we're knee deep in things like netflix and traffic and fox news and everything else that's out there let us be still and know that you are god an ever present help in our times of trouble our refuge and our strength as we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.